Hello and welcome back. In my last video, I went over 10 New Year's resolutions that Linux users might want to think about going into 2024. And I thought it would be a fantastic idea if I went through the first five on this channel and showed you how I would go about completing these projects if I was looking to do them in 2024. The first one on the chopping block is home servers. Now, I'm actually going to split this one into two videos. This first video is going to be all about architecture, planning, uh, that kind of thing when you're thinking about starting a project like this. The second video is going to be a whole lot more practical. I've got a little box over there that we're actually going to set up as a very basic home server, get some cool things running on it, um, so you can see how really easy it is and, um, and what you can kind of get away with when it comes to setting up a very basic server. Now, it's important to note before we begin that I'm only going to be doing the basics in this video. If you're looking for Type 1 hypervisors like ESXi or Zen or Virtual Machines, we're not going to do any of that in this video. This is going to be up about basic bare metal hosts, okay? When I think about servers, there are three major components that go into them. There's the hardware, the operating system, and the services that you choose. I'll go through all three of them and we'll start with hardware. So when it comes to hardware, the main things to consider are the CPU, the memory, the platform you build on, the storage, the power supply, and the network card. The CPU and memory are performance limiting factors. The ones that you choose for these two things will depend on the number of services that you're planning on running, the number of users that you're planning on running, and how intensive those services are to run. When it comes to the processor, of course, if you're a one-person operation, you can really do with quite little. If you're serving one to four people, any uh, hyper-threaded i7 from the last decade will probably do just fine. If you're looking to serve more people around the world, though, you might consider getting an upgrade. Memory is a lot the same. Um, the number of services that you're running and how much memory those services use is going to be a big factor as well. And guys, we all know, when it comes to RAM, if you're going to run a Minecraft server, there's a certain amount of dedicated RAM you're going to have to the server, alright? This is, this is knowledge we all know. The platform, as I mentioned before, um, you can get away with you can get away with very little. The uh, the practical application of this, I've got a a system. It's a small uh, HP small form factor machine. I'll show you it in a minute, but it's running a Core i5 650, not a 6500, a 650. That's uh, one of the Nehalem chips I think from 2010. Um, you can really get away with a little. These days, if you're looking to do anything um, permanent, I'd really only recommend, as I mentioned before, a hyper-threaded i7 or above in performance. You can actually get great deals on um, Intel 10th gen stuff. I remember um, I was setting up a server for a business and the core i3s from the 10th gen, the quad core 8 thread ones, they're, they're actually quite good deals at the moment. So maybe look into them if you're looking to get something a little newer. When it comes to storage devices, I would always recommend that you at least get two so that you can mirror them. Um, I had a situation where I actually lost data because a disk failed on me, and so these days I always mirror my disks. And I know it sucks, like you pay for four terabytes of storage, but you only get two, okay, but you better be safe than sorry, okay, when it comes to protecting your data. The operating system drive, on the other hand, doesn't really matter because the OS is reproducible, right? Like, you can always just reinstall the operating system. You can't do the same with your personal data. Though the one thing to consider there is to make sure you're backing up your config files because, you know, you've set up all this all this stuff, configured all these, file, all these services and things like that. Um, you're going to want to back those up in case the OS drive fails. When it comes to network cards, most motherboards these days will come with at least one gigabit per second um, controllers built in. So if you're just running a one to four person setup, really that's kind of all you need. Um, if you're looking at doing something crazy like replicating something you've seen on reddit r slash home labs, you can go and try and do maybe uh, 2.5 all the way up to 10 gig networking, but that stuff gets expensive very quickly and um, you scale it based on your need. If you don't need that, if one gigabit per second works just great for you and your purposes, then there's no reason. Um, and lastly, I want to chat about the power supply. So really, when it comes to power supplies, you've probably often heard don't skimp on the power supply, especially when it comes to gaming computers and things like that. Well, it's even more important in the server realm. 
Okay, servers typically are going to be running 24-7. If they're not running 24-7, they're going to have um, quite a lot more uptime compared to your average desktop computer, and they might even turn themselves on and off throughout the day. It's important when you're building a server to make sure that you choose a power supply that gives you continuous power and one with a high efficiency rating. Because again, power efficiency is going to be important for saving on your electricity bill. You can do all the optimizations you want with your components. You could buy one of those uh, soldered in Intel Atom socketed boards uh, that consumes like 15 watts. But um, if your power supply is wasting all of those savings as heat, it doesn't really matter anyway. So there's 80 plus white, 80 plus bronze, 80 plus silver, gold, platinum, titanium. Those are the efficiency ratings. Um, my personal server, I'm running an 80 plus gold unit. So tailor it based on how much you're comfortable with wasting in heat and, um, and go from there. But make sure you get a decent power supply. The brands I would recommend would be um, Seasonic, FSP, Corsair's higher end stuff is pretty good. EVGA's higher end stuff is pretty good, as well as Cooler Master's higher end stuff. So next we'll move on to the operating system. Now, the operating system that you choose is largely actually going to be dependent on the services that you're planning to run. So for example, the main operating systems that you might choose for a server could be, uh, you could get Windows Server, Linux, obviously, is a big one, one of the BSDs, and uh, Mac OS Server has been dead in the water for many, many years now, so we won't even bother talking about that one. But you might consider Windows, for instance, if you're planning on using Active Directory. Um, for pretty much anything else, Linux is going to be far better. <laughs> so, and if you're on this channel, Linux is probably the one that you're going to be choosing. In my opinion, Linux is the best all-round server operating system with the widest availability of software you would consider Windows and BSDs for probably more niche setups. For example, if you were going to run a, uh, a VPN server, OpenBSD might be a choice for you because that's a platform based entirely around security. Another thing to consider with operating systems is the file system that you're going to be using for your storage. I mentioned before that you might consider the BSDs in a niche use case. Well, um, FreeNAS, for instance, is based on FreeBSD because FreeBSD for a very long time has had one of the best, most stable and most mature ZFS uh, implementations. ZFS is the post child of the file system uh, meta at the moment. It's the one everyone talks about, it's the one everyone recommends, and I would probably recommend it as well. It's what I'm running on my home server. I'm actually running FreeBSD on my home server and my disks are running ZFS as well. ButterFS is another great file system on Linux. I'm not sure if I'd call it a competitor to ZFS, but they do try and do similar things and they're both great choices. One of the reasons I say this is because they both allow you to do software RAID. That is, to mirror your disks in software without having to buy a separate controller which again, as I mentioned before, you're going to want to mirror your disks. They also, both of these file systems, have support for snapshots. That is capturing the state of your disk at a certain point in time, and the file system keeps track of the difference in one particular file between when the snapshot was captured and all the changes you've made to it to the current time. It's actually very storage efficient and it's a very clever way of doing things. Snapshots can add extra redundancy and can almost replace backups, but uh, not entirely. I'd still recommend you take proper physical backups from time to time. So the next thing to move on to is services. Now, when it comes to choosing your services, really, it's about you. What do you need? What do you want? What do you want from life? What do you want from your career? What do you want from relationships? We're not going to get that deep. We're just going to keep it about servers. What sort of needs are you looking to fill with your server? Are you looking for a file server, a web server, a database? Now listen, okay, this is my hot take. I think in, in Australia, we have a saying, it's, a, it's uh, people mix and match the subject and the, the actual thing that they say, but it, it goes along the lines of every man needs a. <laughs> and so my thing that I would say is every man needs a database. <laughs> it's my hot take. Um, so you could run a database. Do you want to run a media server, like uh, replace Netflix? Do you want to replace Spotify? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Um, so the services that you choose are going to be based on what you want to do. 
And that's a personal question. So as well as thinking about what you want, you can also think about what other people you're trying to serve want. For example, do your parents or grandparents, whenever they come to stay with you, do they want to watch media like on Netflix? I'll give you an example. Me, for instance, I am perfectly happy to go through a folder directory tree in a file browser to pick out what movie I want to watch. But when grandma comes around, she probably wants a Netflix-like interface that's nice and easy, big thumbnails to click on, and, and things like that. So in that case, I might consider running something like Jellyfin or Kodi to serve my uh, media. Another instance would be, for example, with a file server. If you're planning on serving Windows clients or only Windows or Unix clients. So for instance, if you're only looking at serving Linux or Unix clients, you might consider running NFS or SSHFS for file sharing needs. But if you're thinking about adding Windows clients as well, you're going to be running Samba. Um, so these are the things that you really want to be thinking about when you're choosing your services. It's all about the client, and sometimes the client is you. In most cases, when it comes to home servers, the client is you. But the client can also be other members of your family, friends perhaps as well, or visitors coming to stay. The next thing I want to talk about when it comes to architecture is containers. Now containers are a bit of a meme at this point. Um, I think people probably take it a bit too far in some cases. Uh, you know, the whole like containerize everything and where every service gets its own container. But there is an intelligent approach to containers where you can do them, you can do them well, but not overdo them. And containerization is a very important thing for security, in my opinion. So when I think about containerizing services on my home server, I do it based on two things, the purpose of the service and the sensitivity of the service. I'll give you an example. I run a couple of game servers on my home server. I put them all in the same container because the purpose of them is very similar. I've got Minecraft, I've got Terraria, you get some other things as well. Um, they serve games to me and my friends. And the sensitivity is about the same. If it gets compromised, for example, uh, there was a big vulnerability with Java not long ago. I think it was called Log4j or something like that. But if something like that happened and my Minecraft server got compromised, I'm taking backups of my world every once in a while. Who cares? I'll just nuke it and, uh, and redo the container. Um, the purpose and sensitivity of services is the same, you know, between my Minecraft server and my Terraria server. But where that differs is in my file serving. So I have my own personal cloud and I have a public one that's shared on my local network to other members of my household. So my own personal one contains things like my university projects, things that I'm doing at work, um, my own music collection, projects, things like that, you know. Um, and my public one contains things like uh, my, you know, public music collection, videos, um, a shared file hosting thing that they can just dump files onto if they want. And so while the purpose of those two services is the same, the sensitivity is not. I keep them in separate containers. I've got one container for my personal cloud and one container for my public one that's served to my local network. As another example of what I was talking about earlier, my public infrastructure is serving Windows clients. So that container is running Samba. But for my own personal devices, I'm only worrying about Linux and Unix clients. So I'm running SSHFS only to serve my own private cloud. So there you go. That's a pretty basic uh, introduction to home server architecture. A couple things to think about. Um, we're actually going to go ahead and dive into a practical, uh, practical installation next video, which is think I think is going to be very fun. Let me go and grab the. Uh, I actually grab the server for you. Oh, so this bad boy right here is what we're going to be looking at. It's a uh, Acer Aspire small form factor thing. It's pretty old, it's pretty bad. It's got uh, i5-650, probably about um, eight gigs of RAM. And we're gonna set this thing up as a very basic server with some very basic services. And I think that's gonna be a lot of fun. So that's it from me. That's it from this guy for now. Um, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for tuning in.